DuPont presents Judith Anderson and Burgess Meredith in Native Land on the Cavalcade of America. quality of voice, there is a song that nobody ever quite forgets, is the voice of one half of the human race, a woman's voice, is something to reduce the shock of being born, something to make death a little easier to face, a comfort in time of sorrow, a lullaby. And our play tonight is as simple as that lullaby and is old, and yet it is for today and of today. And so, through this medium of radio, we are going to bring you some old stories and some new stories of women. And then we shall see if they don't all add up to one story that is important for today. DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry, presents the distinguished actress of the American stage, Judith Anderson, with Burgess Meredith again as your narrator in Native Land on the Cavalcade of America. <laughs> Monday, September 29th, 1941. We have come a long way, and we will go on from here. For there is an originator among us, a creator of ourselves, a renewer, a multiplier, a woman. Many things to worry her, so much depending on her. Yet out of the patient little tasks, sewing and mending and fixing things over, and thinking things over, a citizen of the world is emerging, a new woman, They've been announcing her arrival for a long time. They thought maybe she was Mrs. Pankhurst. She thought she might be like Mary Curie, a scientist, discoverer of elements. Or Amelia Earhart, a friar, a pioneer. They didn't know she was not one woman, but many. Not then or when, but right now. Monday, 29th, 1941. Well, here we are again. They're even bringing back the styles, making us look like 1918. But it's not like 1918. There's something different this time. I don't mind giving up stockings, but they'll find out lipstick really means something to a woman's morale. I'm not going to sit home. Not me. I'm learning his job, too, just in case. Sometimes I wonder about bringing more children into the world the way it is. But John wants children, and so do I. We can't just stop living, no matter what happens. September 29th, 1941. Yes, we will go on. There is a comforter, a binder up of wounds among us, a nurse, a lover. She is the old and the new principle we always come back to, love. The love stories of our native land are endless. There is one they tell about a woman who was a citizen of this republic when it was still only a hope, only a dream in the minds of a few brave men and women. It is a curious kind of love story, one you have to look at closely even to see the love in it. Judith Anderson is going to play it for you now. And it all took place in the kitchen of a farmhouse near Lancaster, Pennsylvania, in the third year of the War of Independence, the year 1778. Get away, Miranda. I've got to strain this milk before you get any. Now, oh, stop your fretting. I declare you've been short-tempered ever since Ezra went off to the war. I reckon I have to. Ain't right leaving a lone woman on a farm this way, the milking and the feeding and the plowing to do. Now, what are them dratted dogs yelping at? Ain't no use my telling them to stop. They don't heed me. It's Ezra they always listen to. Uh, well, they stopped anyway. Now, here's your milk. Someone's outside. 
Good thing I got Ezra's old flintlock here beside me. Who's there? Speak up, mister. I got the draw on you. I'm warning you. Ezra. Oh, well, of course I'm going to kiss you. There. <laughs> I declare, a body you think we was just Spartan instead of being old married folks. Now, what's the matter, Ezra? What are you scared of? Oh, wait, I'll take a look out. Why, well, ain't no one out there following you. No, no, no. No one in the yard and nor on the road. Why are you worrying what, about what they do to deserters? Ezra, you ain't. Oh, of course you ain't. A man's got a right to get home and see how his farm's getting on. Well, sit down and let me get you some vittles, Ezra. You look all starved out. And no wonder coming all the way here from Valley Forge in this weather. And dressed in them rags. Well, last I heard tell you it was six months ago from some place called Brandywine. Squire Kelson's boy was running back from there. Had a leg off. That is how you was in that battle with him. Said you was mighty brave. Made me right proud hearing him talk like that. I reckon lots of men are leaving Valley Forge. Can't blame them, I guess, with the cold and the snow and nothing but rags on their feet. Yeah, yeah, I heard of him. Von Steuben, German, ain't he? <laughs> Lafayette, Pulaski. Almost seems like sometimes these foreigners were doing more fighting for independence than we are. Hmm, uh-huh. Yeah, I heard tell of that, too. This Steuben has you drilling the whole day long. Of course, maybe drilling is good in some ways. Maybe if we'd had more drilling of our militia before, we'd still be holding Philadelphia. Oh, I, I can understand you coming home like this. And like you say, you'll go back in the spring after you get thawed out. But I reckon plenty of them just say that as an excuse to desert. And to my way of thinking, Ezra, there ain't no excuse for a deserter. When you think of the ones that stay in there... They're all that's keeping our hopes together these days. Of course you ain't, Ezra. I know that. No, no. I ain't laughing at you. I couldn't laugh at a thing like that. Ezra, listen. The horseman. He turned in here. He's coming up the lane. Ezra, you get down that wood chest and hide. Quick. Come in. Oh, it's you, Squire Kelson. Oh, poor Mrs. Kelson. Pretty sad losing a fine boy like Joe. You tell Miss Kelson I'll be right over. Good night, Squire. You can come out now, Ezra. It was Squire. Oh, you, you heard. Ezra, back to Valley Forge. But I thought you said you was going to stay here on the farm for a while. The cold, Ezra, the snow. You ain't got the proper clothes. I miss you, Ezra. I miss you more than you'll ever know. No. No, no, no. Don't talk like that. No, don't, Ezra. Of course it was a mistake, but you're going back. And we ain't never going to talk about it again. Kiss me goodbye, Ezra. Goodbye. We'll be winning, Ezra. Because we got right on our side. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be waiting for you to come back. woman who sent her man back to Valley Forge was not to be the last of her race. She's lived in many places in her time. You can look for her in the hills in the frontier country. The men went there first alone, and with them the center of town was a saloon. And then the women came. The center of town became a school, a town hall, a courthouse, a skyscraper. And a few weeks ago, the women changed it again. The center of town was an enclosure of chicken wire piled high with aluminum. 
Old aluminum, old pots and pans, but not for sale. The people crowded around it, admiring the women's gift to their nation. Excuse me. Can I get through, please? Why, sure, Miss Brady. What's the trouble, ma'am? You lose something? Well, it's my little saucepan. See, it's right on top of the stack there. I want to get it back. Well, uh, Miss Brady... See, my daughter gave it to the man while I was out. I bought one to put in its place. It's brand new. Oh, sure, sure, Miss Brady. We'll swap with you. The old one don't look much like... I know. But it, it means a lot to me, Mr. Simmons. I've had it almost 20 years. It was a wedding present. The only one I ever got. The little sacrifices, the hundred little things that would help so much, tearfully given up when the time comes for giving things up. Yes, women are like that. And then there are women as their men sometimes see them. Yes, women are like that, too. There is a woman in East Orange, New Jersey, whose husband is always bringing home convenient little presents. Don't tell me you paid two ninety eight for that. Well, that's not much. Look at all the things it'll do. It'll open cans and bottles. It's a glass cutter, a pencil sharpener. It's got a compass in the handle. But we have a can opener, and it paid three or four dollars. It wasn't three or four dollars. It was two ninety eight. And we haven't got a decent can opener in the house. Here, let me show you. Where's the can you were going to open for supper? This one? I was. You know, you could make your work twice as easy if you had any kind of instinct about machinery. Now you just slip this little thing over here. <laughs> kind of stiff at first. <laughs> Arthur, did you hurt yourself? No, no, I just caught my thumb. Very simple. Now you just slip it again. <laughs> Arthur, maybe you better let me... Uh, hand me the hammer out of that drawer. Uh... The hammer. Yeah, thanks. Now... This thing fits over this thing. What the... The meat's thing. getting cold, dear. Just a minute now. Just a minute. Must have been busted when he sold it to me. Dear, what's the compass in the handle for? Oh, that truck. That... What? How do I know if I ever get my hand in this thing? Yes, women are like that, as any husband can tell you. And women can tell you some things about themselves. There's a woman in Gary, Indiana, who was talking to a very dear friend from a public phone booth. Well, I simply told her that if it was a child of mine, I'd try to see that he had some manners. And do you know what she had the nerve to tell me? I'll be through in just a minute. Just some people waiting to use the phone. You'd think it was the only public telephone in town. Well, as I said... Your time is up. That will be five cents for an additional three minutes, please. Oh, uh, oh all right, just a minute. Hang on, Evelyn. Oh, dear. I don't think I have... Uh, lady, I, I gotta catch a train. I... Oh, mister, would you mind getting this dime changed for yeah, me? but, lady... Uh... I'll really be through in just a minute. Yeah, yeah, but... Are you still there, Evelyn? Well, hang on. A man just went to get me some change. Now, where was I? Oh, yes, so I said to her... Well, Mrs. Thompson, I... Women are like that. This week, there was a woman in Eastport, a New England woman, who saw her only son off on the train, a son in an army uniform. Take good care of yourself, son. And write me every time there's a boat. I'll be all right, Mom. I know, but the place they're sending you to is sounds so cool, so far away. Well, goodbye, Mom. Goodbye, son. Goodbye. story, an old story. The age-old story of the woman who must say goodbye and wait at home. A great dramatist has caught and told that story in a play that is the acknowledged classic of our time. His name, John Millington Singh. His play, Riders to the Sea. We've chosen it for this story of women on the cavalcade of America because it expresses more eloquently than we can hope to the universal strength of women in every age and time. The woman of Riders to the Sea is a mother named Mara, played by Judith Anderson. And the scene is a tiny island off the Irish coast, but for that matter, it could be any island or any continent. 
And the characters are men and women in all times who face the inevitable. In Aaron, the inevitable is the sea. It's you, Nora. Where's Mother? She's lying down in her room, God help her, and maybe sleeping if she's able. Is the sea bad out, Nora? Midland bad, God help us. And it's worse it'll be getting when the tides turn to the wind. What is it you have under your shawl, Nora? A shirt and a plain stocking that got off a drowned man in Donegal. No. I, our brother Michael, they are. He was washed ashore in Donegal after nine full days. God spare his soul. Oh, Nora. Isn't it a pitiful thing when there's nothing left of a man who was a great rower and fisher but a bit of an old shirt and a plain stocking? It's the death of mother it would be to know of this. And Bartley may be going to the sea this very day. Shh. It's mother herself is coming. Now, do you put the clothes behind the chimney? Isn't it enough of a fire you have on the hearth for this day and evening, Kathleen? Uh, there's a cake baking at the fire for a short space, mother. And Bartley will want it when the tide turns if he goes to Connemara. Bartley won't go this day with the wind rising from the south and west. He won't go this day and leave me destitute with no son living at all. I heard Stephen Fetty and Colm Sean say he would go. Where is he now? He went down to see would there be another boat sailing in the week. I I hear someone passing the big stones on the path outside. It's Bartley coming. Can you tell me where is that bit of new rope was bought in Connemara? Now, do you get it for him, Nora? You'll find it on a nail in the wall where stand the white boards were brought in for making the coffin if need be. I hung it there this morning for the pig with the black feet was eating it. Here it is. You'd do right to leave that rope, Bartley, hanging there by the boards. It'll be wanting in this place, I'm telling you. If Michael is washed up tomorrow morning, or the next morning, or any morning in the week, for it's a deep grave we'll make him by the grace of God. I need the rope. Otherwise, I've no halter the way I can ride down on the red mare. And I must go now, quickly. This is the one boat going for two weeks or beyond it. And the fair will be a good fair for horses, I heard them saying below. It's a hard thing they'll be saying below if your brother's body is washed up and there's no man here to make the coffin. And I have to give him a big price for the finest white boards you'll find in Connemara. How would it be washed up, Mother? And we have to look in each day now for nine days. And a strong wind blowing a while back from the west and south. And I'll be going down now. But you'll see me coming back again in two days or in three days or... Maybe in four days, if the wind is bad. Isn't it a hard and cruel man won't hear a word from a woman? And she, his mother, holding him from the sea. It's the life of a young man to be doing a man's things, mother. He'd gone to the sea or whatever need be. And I must go now quickly. I ride down on the red mare, and the gray pony will run behind me. I'll fetch a good price at the Galway Fair, and I bringing it back with me for your needs in a day or maybe two days. Blessing of God on you. He's gone now. God spare us and we'll not see him again. He's gone now. And when the black night is fallen, I'll have no son left me in the world. Why wouldn't you give him your blessing, Mother, and he looking round in the door? Isn't it sorrow enough as on everyone in this house without your sending him out with an unlucky word behind him and a hard word in his ear? The Son of God forgive us, Kathleen. We're out to forgetting to give Bartley his bit of bread. Here, Mother, do you take it and let you go down to the well and give it to him and he passing. You'll see him then, and the dark word will be broken, and you can say God speed you the way he'll be easy in his mind. Give her the stick, Kathleen, or maybe she'll slip on the big stones. The stick Michael brought from Connemara. Thank you, child. Michael's stick. All that's left of him. Aye. In the big world, the old people to believe in things after them for their sons and children. But in these days, in this place, it is the young men do believe in things behind for them that do be old. Sit by the fire, Mother, and warm yourself. Didn't you give him his bit of bread, Mother? You still have it in your hand. What is it ails you at all, Mother? I've seen the fearfulest thing any person has seen since the day Bride Dara seen the dead man with a child in his arms. 
tell us what it was. I went down to the well. Then Bartley came along, and he riding on the red mare and not stopping. Oh, the son of God spare us. Then I seen him. What is it you seen? I seen Michael himself. Nay, mother. It wasn't Michael you seen. His body is after being found in the far north. And he's got a clean burial, by the grace of God. I tell you, I'm after seeing him this day. And he riding and galloping, Barsley on the red mare, and he going by quickly, and the blessing of God on you, he says. I looked up then, and there was the gray pony running after, and Michael upon it, with fine clothes on him and new shoes on his feet. No, Mother. It was not Michael. Michael is after being found near Donegal. Give her the clothes of his they found, Kathleen, so she may see for herself. A bit of shirt and a plain stocking. It is his they are, surely. Bartley will be lost now, too. Let you call in Eamon and make a good coffin out of the white boards for Bartley. It is Bartley will be safe, Mother. Didn't the young priest say the Almighty God wouldn't leave you self-destitute with no son living? It's little the likes of him knows of the sea. I've had a husband and a husband's father and six sons in this house. Six fine men. And some of them were found and some of them were not found. But they're gone now, the lot of them. There were Stephen and Sean were lost in the great wind and found after in the Bay of Gregory. And carried up the two of them on the one plank and in by that door that looks out to the sea... What's that, Kathleen? She's someone calling us from the shore, surely. They carried them in, and I stood here waiting. And I seen two women and three women and four women coming in, and they crossing themselves and not saying the word. Nora, it's them. The old women and the old men. Kathleen, Nora, is it Patch or Michael they come for? Or what is it at all? Why are the old women coming in like this and I just tell them of it? They're carrying the thing among them. And there's water dripping out of it. Is it Bartley, it is? It is surely, Maura. God rest his soul. Softly now, Patrick. Lift him up and lay him on the table. Aye. What way now was my son drowned? The grey pony knocked him into the sea. And he was washed out where there's a great surf on the white rocks. Yeah, the grey pony, is it? Aye. They're all gone. Six sons and a husband and a husband's father. All gone. And there isn't anything more the sea can do to me. Colin. Aye. Maybe yourself and Eamon would make a coffin when the sun rises. Be there are nails with the boards there, Kathleen. There are not, Colin. We didn't think of the nails. The great one that you wouldn't think of the nails. It isn't that I haven't prayed for you, Bartley and Michael, to the Almighty God. It isn't that I haven't said prayers in the dark night till you wouldn't know what I'd be saying. But it's a great rest I'll have now, the way all women have when the time is done. And great sleeping in the long night. My son Michael has a clean burial in the far north. And my son Bartley will have a fine coffin, and both of them having done what they had to do. What more can we want of them than that? No man at all can be living forever. And a woman must be satisfied, and she going on with life to the end. We've come a long way. We will go on from here. For there is an originator among us, a creator of ourselves, a multiplier, a woman. And whatever new thing she will be doing will be from the ancient source of her strength, out of the old and new principle, love and the courage to go on.
are listening to Native Land on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. The National Defense Program headlines the news of the day, a program so vast it challenges the mind to grasp it. Planned and executed in typically American style, it will succeed, partly because all the precious know-how of American industry is behind it. One of the main reasons America has such knowledge is that as a nation, we believe in research. American industry spends $300 million a year on research, with 2,300 companies employing more than 70,000 trained research specialists, a vast reservoir of knowledge upon which the nation can draw. Chemistry has long been a leader in research in the United States, with chemical and allied industries employing by far the greatest number of research workers. The DuPont Company alone maintains 31 research laboratories in various sections of the country. What do they do? Well, a laboratory at Richmond, Virginia, continually works to improve rayon yarn. From a DuPont laboratory at Buffalo, New York, has come Fiber D, a wonderful new textile fiber which promises better wearing, more brilliant, moth-proof rugs and carpets. From a DuPont research group at Deepwater, New Jersey, came the antioxidants that enable the gasolines you buy today to perform at high efficiency without fouling your motor. From another research group came the first commercial production of Freon Refrigerant, which makes your refrigerator the safe and efficient household friend it is today. From still another DuPont research laboratory came Nylon. Research is the very lifeblood of a chemical company like DuPont. In a sense, indeed, research is the company. Two kinds of research. The kind that tackles an industrial problem and solves it. And the other kind of research that sets out just to learn something, and then out of knowledge gained, out of money and time and energy spent, out of the patience and the hard work and the worry, comes up smiling with a new plastic, a new yarn, or a new and better way, perhaps, of making an old product. Out of research came the know-how for the American defense production program that is shifting today into high gear. And out of research, too, will come our brighter tomorrow, with new industries that may seem as strange at first as the automobile seemed in 1900 or as television seems today, bringing Americans new opportunities in the richer, happier world that is implicit in the DuPont pledge, better things for better living through chemistry. <laughs> Next week, the Cavalcade of America will present the great American actor Paul Muni in an original radio play by the eminent screenwriter Dudley Nichols. In this, his first play written for radio, Dudley Nichols has told the amazing story of Simone Bolivar, who first dreamed of Pan American unity. On Cavalcade next week, Bolivar the Liberator starring Paul Muni. On the Cavalcade of America, you have heard Judith Anderson featured in a dramatic monologue and in a radio adaptation of John Millington Sings, Riders to the Sea. Native Land was prepared under the supervision of Robert L. Richards in collaboration with Robert Tallman. This is Burgess Meredith sending best wishes from DuPont. This is the Red Network of the National Broadcasting Company.